today we welcome Carl Putzer, Professor of Geography at University of Texas at Austin. He has an endowed professorship of liberal arts here. Uh, Carl is one of the few colleagues who can count as being both a physical geographer and a cultural geographer. His interests span geology to Neolithic archaeology. He is just as much at home in North America as in Europe. He has conducted research in the Mediterranean, in Africa, and particularly in Spain. But one of the interesting things is that he is equally interested in the conceptual and theoretical developments of the discipline, as he is a most careful and dedicated empirical researcher. You are a very complex person, Carl, and I'm fascinated that you came today and that we can discuss something of your background, uh, what led you to such a catholicity of interests, and what you see as exciting to pursue in the future. But first, why don't you tell me something of your background? your childhood experiences, and what led you to geography? Well, I suppose that uh, one can start that off relatively early. Um, my parents immigrated to uh, England from uh, Germany in the 1930s because uh, my father was uh, politically opposed to the regime in power at the time. And as a result, I grew up in the British and subsequently in the Canadian system and um, went towards my uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in McGill and subsequently went back to Germany on a scholarship to uh, work for the PhD at the University of Bonn. So uh, in a sense it's kind of a full circle of uh, uh, experiences and exposures to do two different culture worlds. And then subsequently I took my first university position at Wisconsin and uh, in Chicago and finally here in Texas. So that um, the American experience is sort of a uh, second level of, uh, shall we say, living in the uh, Anglophone world. And uh, uh, obviously I feel uh, in most ways like uh, a North American, but uh, the old world ties are quite strong. And uh, with that, of course, comes a uh, uh, perhaps a stronger avocation than most uh, Americans might feel to working in the old world and uh, also uh, being much more sensitive to uh, the complexity of culture in the old world uh, that simply comes from realizing those uh, many little differences and signals that people give when uh, they belong to a particular uh, uh, dialect group or to uh, particular town loyalty, whatever it might be, which are things that are rather unusual in terms of the United States. Uh -huh. But that childhood experience, how old were you when you uh, moved from England to... Uh, I was two or three at the time. Yes. And growing up in Canada, were there any particular experiences that made you curious about geography? Well, I always liked the great outdoors, and uh, we had a country house in the mountains, and uh, I spent three or four months a year there, and uh, uh, from that grew, I suppose, a kind of uh, intuitive feeling for... Uh, uh, field work in uh, physical geography. Um, it was always something I was quite comfortable in rather than a sort of experience that somebody really grew up in an urban world uh, uh, feeling somewhat out of place in uh, the African savannah someplace uh, 500 miles from the nearest town. I see. Well, were there teachers? Were there certain books you read? Or was it merely the out of doors and the exploratory side? Well, uh, I suppose that um, um, being in a um, uh, country house for much of the year, I also did a lot of reading, which I probably wouldn't have done if I had grown up in the city. And um, in my college years, I uh, did a lot of reading in the summers that uh, didn't relate at all to the uh, mathematics that I was supposed to be majoring in, in college at the time. And uh, that had a major uh, impact on me. I um, read... Uh, in the bridge edition of uh, Toynbee's study of history in second or third year college and uh, it absolutely fascinated me and uh, subsequently in um, my last year of college I stumbled by accident into a year's course in um, essentially kind of a world social geography that was taught by a um, really inspired young geographer from Oxford who was a physical geographer and who was being 
in a sense, placed in a position of teaching a course that was not in physical geography, and he tried in many ways to uh, bridge two sides of the uh, field. And um, with the interests I had, this uh, appealed to me immensely. And uh, uh, after about three weeks, I told my parents, I said, this is where I go after I get that degree in honors math. Uh, I'll do it for uh, your satisfaction. And you feel that I have a career potential, which they never believed I would have in geography. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Who was that teacher? What was his name? His name was Hugh Thompson. Um, he uh, unfortunately died two or three years later of a uh, heart attack while working on the Baffin Ice Sheet. And uh, so it was one of those things where you never got disillusioned later by how he turned out, shall we say, and uh, it always sort of remained as that sort of single point of inspiration. And um, at McGill in the uh, uh, first year in graduate school, subsequently, um, I worked with Ken Hare, who uh, uh, had a very uh, liberal interpretation of uh, what people do, and uh, he just sort of, in a sense, encouraged me to do extensive reading on things that I liked. And uh, um, I tried to search what there was in the geographical literature that related to, uh, in effect, the kinds of uh, um, cues that I received from Toynbee's book. And uh, I was then, in a sense, encouraged to read the uh, Ellsworth Huntington literature, which I did uh, quite carefully. And I read a variety of things dealing with uh, um, climate and uh, human physiology and other types of things of this ilk. And uh, the possibilists, I, I had a translation of favor that I was given. and. Uh, when I've been through it all, I said, so, somehow this isn't working. No, no. no. <laughs> and um, so I began to work more in um, empirical things that crystallize out into a master's thesis on uh, the Near East and um, uh, climatic variation on the one hand and nomadic migrations on the other as essentially a test of whether or not one could do something there. And uh, uh, it didn't work very well, the uh, data on in either category are really quite unsatisfactory. And um, when all was said and done, I uh, was rather disillusioned about the quality of the empirical work that one generally found in publications. And um, when I went to Germany for the PhD, um, I fairly consciously, in fact, began to gather empirical data on my own and uh, um, opportunity of some field trips to uh, Egypt and uh, other areas at the time uh, showed me that it was very well possible in a short time to see and learn things in the field that you simply never would find in a textbook. Textbooks were really, in fact, quite useless in the field. Uh, I had gone through every available geomorphology book before I went to Egypt, and very little that I saw in Egypt actually corresponded to what I had read in the book. And um, from this, I began to realize that uh, uh, in the field, you could generate data of your own that was a great deal more useful, and where you had a sense of not only the quality, but how far you could, in a sense, take it as something that was reliable, uh, where the limitations were. And um, over a longer period of time, from there on in, I then was able to um, um, continue on this trajectory uh, that uh, really was very different from what I had started off uh, in that McGill. But uh, that goes a bit further than the original but, question. But it's sort of a yes, but there's something that puzzles me, though. Um, what attracted you about uh, this Thompson's lectures and, and Toynbee was the sort of macro hypothesis about things, um, the deductive approach, as it were. And yet you rebelled against it. You liked it on the one hand. Your imagination was challenged by it. But when you began to work, you became very much inductive. You wanted right, the yes. data and build it. Would you say you're an inductive type? Or a no, I think that I, I really <coughs> like to alternate the two approaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a while, I was uh, fascinated by the uh, uh, bigger generalizing approach and um, found that it was a fascinating arena to work. But eventually, I realized that uh, it wasn't possible to do this uh, in a way that was really responsible at least with the information that I had, and uh, felt that I had to 
in a sense, immerse myself in the inductive type of work. Mm -hmm. And I did that for quite some time and uh, uh, never lost uh, an interest uh, and concern with the first, but felt in a sense that this was part of a growing experience. Yes. Yes. And when I came back, it was <coughs> consciously, I, mm -hmm. I felt that the interest was there. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I was shocked when uh, um, there was a uh, while working on some moraines in northern Spain with one of my best graduate students in 1969, I think it was, um, we were talking quite uh, casually, and uh, he made the comment that I was known among the graduate students as the hyper-empiricist. Uh -huh. And I was stunned, absolutely stunned, because I never thought of myself as an empiricist as such. And I realized that uh, I had, in a sense, in class always emphasize that it isn't that easy. Mm -hmm. You can't generalize that quickly on this and so on. That this had in a sense been a kind of a, almost a preoccupation. And uh, from there on in I was conscious of this as a sense of a, in the sense of giving a wrong signal. And uh, I then began to much more consciously work towards um, being at the same time constructive and seeing what one could cautiously devise by way of uh, shall we say, uh, normative views on something, and um, to balance out my natural tendency to be uh, perhaps hypercritical at times uh, with uh, a uh, more constructive way of looking at things. And uh, so I began to be much more concerned with uh, uh, developing uh, models, shall we say. But that was a real shock. And mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, in a sense, told me that my classroom posture, at least, uh, was not uh, in conformity with the way I really thought. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> but at Bonn, what, preparing for your Doctor of Science degree there, uh, w what was the atmosphere like? Did it favor the model building or did it favor the field empirical approach? It was entirely uh, empirical. And in a sense, I suppose that uh, going in the direction I did uh, was influenced by that. It was a, uh, um, a laissez-faire atmosphere by definition. Um, in part because of the uh, uh, very large number of students that a professor had to advise so that you uh, got a chance for to deal, to tail a conversation with your professor maybe once or twice a year if you were lucky. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were otherwise very much on your own devices. And uh, um, Carl Troll, who was uh, essentially the department, um, was a field man. Um, and this was all that he really conveyed in his lectures was this uh, tremendous fascination with observation and uh, also at the same time synthesis drawn from actual observation. And um, the years were really quite influential because uh, uh, I learned something about the uh, necessity of going beyond description. Troll rarely gave anything that came from a secondary source. And uh, he was always balancing out the presentation of detail on the one hand and drawing interpretations and synthesis on the other. And uh, um, on some of the uh, weekend field trips that we took, um, although I never took notes um, and perhaps appeared very much like a casual observer in the back of the bus, uh, I was in fact uh, learning something that has been with me ever since, namely that uh, you can actually read a landscape, uh, not just as uh, a physical or biotic world, but also the cultural world that you see. And that it is possible to analyze it analytically as you go along by uh, pointing out uh, physical attributes or traits or morphology, whatever, but at the same time that you in fact are reading out of it historical facts, cultural details and nuances and so on. and. Um, that, uh, subliminally at least, uh, stayed with me as being perhaps uh, the highest state of the geographer's art. And uh, I feel that I learned a great deal more from Carl Troll um, in that sense uh, than I ever did from uh, the types of materials that he presented in class or um, the inspiration or uh, feedback or whatever that he gave me in terms of my dissertation which were reasonably uh, uh, good considering uh, what other people got at the time, but uh, really were not uh, 
the type of contact that uh, I like to uh, provide the students I work with me. That's interesting. Uh, he, he was one of the big names in landscape ecology, yes, the mm -hmm. ecological synthetic approach to landscape. And you have continued that. You do that with your own students. To, you know, uh, I suppose I do. I do it very differently. Um, I felt while I was uh, working on those things in Bonn and I came rather close to at one point because I translated one of his papers uh, into English. Um, I wasn't 100% enthusiastic about the way he did things, but I would say that the broader mood of how he thought definitely had a major impact on me, but again, something that I only appreciated five and ten years later. Uh -huh. Yes, one is rarely aware at the time, yeah. yes. But now, you, with your Germanic background and your experience in the Anglo world, how come the fascination with the Mediterranean? Well, uh, um, that is very much a, um, an emotional thing. Um, uh, to work in an area with enthusiasm, I really have to be excited by it. And I'm not really excited by uh, uh, cloudy, humid, uh, rather mundane landscapes. And uh, this is the category that uh, transalpine Europe, or most of the United States, falls into for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, in uh, 1954, I took a uh, trip to Spain. And um, I um, was on this uh, rather old rickety uh, wooden carriage, crammed in with a lot of people. and it, uh, at uh, dawn, I uh, looked out of the uh, car and uh, saw the uh, pink glow of the sunrise on the wheat fields of northern Castile with a few puffs of cloud. And uh, a few minutes later, the uh, uh, medieval walls of the city of Avila uh, loomed up on the horizon. And uh, that was an impression I just never forgot. And uh, uh, when I went to um, uh, graduate school the subsequent year at McGill, um, every weekly colloquium was on uh, measuring uh, the depth of permafrost in some part of northern Canada or icebergs calving in Greenland and I had that very strong conviction in me I don't really care and uh, when I have a chance I'm going south rather than north and they can have the permafrost. <laughs> That's amazing. I think that it's, it has happened for so many. The appeal is aesthetic and emotional. Yes, very much so. And often the contrast to one's normal life is what it makes it attractive. But did the Mediterranean also allow you to pursue simultaneously your interests in the physical processes, physical landscape, and the human history? Was the Mediterranean a good arena for looking at this in an integrated way? It was, but... Um it didn't seem at first that uh, I was, in fact, pursuing those types of goals. Uh, most of the work I did in Spain, um, after the initial year or two that I worked in uh, Mallorca, was in association with um, archaeological excavations. This was obviously an insight into culture. But um, it's a fairly arid form of culture that you get out of a Paleolithic excavation. Uh, what I did not realize, again, that part of the growing experience was understanding the workmen with whom we worked. Um, we worked there three seasons uh, with the uh, essentially total labor force of two small hamlets. And uh, I learned a tremendous amount, uh, again, subconsciously, from seeing how these people interacted, the uh, relationship of the mayor uh, of a community that had eight families to the other people there, the role that that mayor had with respect to roughly 20 workmen from a somewhat larger village, which was further away, uh, the role of uh, a village in another direction where this one village would have absolutely no social contact at all, so that in fact the workmen refused to use the mayor or allow the mayor to be the foreman, and eventually all left. And then finally, the role of the parish priest, who service all of these communities and who had a rather a strange relationship to them for various reasons. Uh, and uh, he was brought into uh, a conflict about uh, how much payment had to be used to indemnify one owner of a field on which we had worked. And, and seeing the interaction of everybody sitting around talking for, in a sense, two days. There was tremendous commotion and 
Eventually an arrangement was reached with the priest trying to serve as an intermediary, but eventually I realized that what had seemed to be a major coup of our excavation director in bringing him in uh, didn't work out quite that way because uh, um, he was not allowed to play the role that we thought he would play, and in fact the uh, decision was made uh, on a much more personal level. But seeing these interactions between those people and seeing how they thought and worked and their ins insistence on uh, personal quality control of what they did, their a strong pride in their work, uh, their relationships with each other, and this what probably is the central part of the whole story. The effort of all of these people to get along, the sense of community, the uh, avoiding of conflict, uh, this was something that stayed with me in an incredibly vivid way so that when I eventually became more and more explicitly involved in uh, cultural features, phenomena, and uh, became uh, engaged in work in younger time ranges, it was unconsciously the experience with these people that always came back to me. This was a real world of interaction. It was a kind of a, a laboratory where I had grown up without realizing it was a laboratory. And uh, the uh, sum of all the things that I learned in Spain that dealt with contemporary Spain and traditional life ways, and particularly agriculture and livestock and so on, actually came from these many years of working in the uh, context of Paleolithic and uh, so on excavations. Um, in the course I gave last year on historical geography of Spain, I finally packed out all my slides, and uh, there were about six and a half thousand uh, taken from Spain in those earlier years. And uh, from that, I was able to put together an incredible cultural geography of settlement types, of uh, traditional agriculture, uh, herding, and so on, that uh, I'd obviously been subconsciously paying attention to along the way, but had never really seen as part of something in the bigger scheme of things. That was marvelous that you were open to the learning something from the experience instead of just being exasperated by the fact <laughs> it wasn't operating like a German situation would operate. I mean, it's, you, the social geography of the actual site was gave you as much information about life Ultimately, as yes. the archaeology yeah. dig. That was yeah. marvelous. And in fact, I began <coughs> at that time to uh, um, interview people about uh, things uh, and did not, in fact, realize that I'd begun asking people about how they did things and why at that point, uh, namely um, from the point of view of trying to understand the differences of soil quality, which was directly relevant to the work. But I've for the first time there really was experimenting in terms of asking people about how a soil type is called, how it's distinguished, uh, what the advantages and disadvantages are, and so on. And uh, that sort of opened up that first door of what you get from asking people as opposed to uh, just sort of traveling by car and uh, making inferences which are often quite wrong kind of ethno-methodology, yes, without was, calling yeah. it that. Yeah. But I don't know where the archaeological element came in first for you. Was this during the Bonn years? Or? Yes, it, it yeah. happened. Um, it, well, there was a logic to it, because the uh, uh, dealing with um, uh, nomadic migrations, which sort of started the whole thing off, brings you into culture history. When you then work with geomorphology for a longer period of time, the sense of extension of time into the Pleistocene mm -hmm. is very uh, easy. You uh, then have to deal with the um, prehistoric record. So you read the prehistoric literature, you try to find out what the criteria are for attaching uh, cultural designations to uh, Nile terraces or whatever it might be. So you become involved. Um, it then happened that on my second trip to Egypt, um, Carl Troll had just heard about a um, young Egyptologist that was going to uh, work in Egypt on a survey, uh, looking for very late prehistoric sites. And he suggested that I might want to get in touch with him to uh, perhaps coordinate our work, because this might give me uh, uh, some good opportunities. Um, so we spent um, a longer period than I care for um, uh, walking up and down the sides of the Nile Valley. Uh, we walked, in effect, half of the stretch from uh, Luxor to Cairo in the process, and uh, we didn't get along very well at all. But uh, the constant questions that he was raising um, gave me a very good idea about uh, 
uh, what people coming out of the humanities don't understand about the landscape or the logic of why there are settlements here and not there and what are strategies of um, where we should be concentrating our uh, looking efforts because there's a good probability of finding something there as opposed to someplace else. So from this I began to um, develop a, uh, an explicit sense of strategies of, you might call it archaeological excavation or other survey, that come from uh, criteria uh, of um, landscape classification and trying to integrate these two and find a logic as to why you would or would not expect a site here or on this particular stretch. So the uh, interest in archaeological problems um, very concretely uh, came together at that time and I was, you know, engaged in this type of thing for a long time uh, because of the uh, opportunities that this type of work offered in a t an era where uh, the National Science Foundation had discovered the concept of interdisciplinary research. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, you recognized early what archaeology had to teach geography or human science, but you also brought a lot to archaeology uh, by introducing archaeologists to this other dimension, the economic, the cultural, the social, which maybe there weren't, or the aerial, the landscape, uh, which maybe hadn't been a practice in archaeology before you entered the field. Uh, shall we say, initially, I certainly didn't uh, offer anything in the uh, cultural arena, because in a sense I was trying to develop a set of systematics of how to bring, um, shall we say, landscape criteria into a framework that could be used um, in archaeological research. And um, there was another stimulus to this that uh, when I went to Wisconsin, um, I was not allowed to teach a course in geomorphology. Um, geomorphology under the title geomorphology was a prerogative of the geology department, hence it was a hands-off issue. And at the same time, we had a gentleman in the department that taught landforms, so that was closed. But uh, the suggestion was made that there is a course on the books called Introduction to Historical Geography. And maybe you could use that as an avenue to do something that would be a combination of uh, your uh, Pleistocene interests and uh, prehistory and who knows whatever. And uh, that is exactly what happened. I used that as a way to uh, uh, bring together uh, prehistoric research with uh, more standard quaternary studies and um, to develop these in a systematic way that was not just alongside of each other but also uh, brought together points of interfingering. And in the course of that, I started uh, uh, systematically working out classification of, you might call it geological sites, uh, ways of uh, um, providing a kind of uh, normative framework of where to look and how to do it. And um, on the basis of that course, my um, uh, environment archaeology as a book came mm. together. I wondered if it was out of that experience, yeah. because this is this is your one of your most popular books. I think it has circulated very widely, and it is acclaimed by archaeologists and by geographers, right? Well, uh, 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 geographers subsequently did uh, apparently uh, find yes. something of merit in it, but they didn't actually review it. No, well, that's an edit that's a story of sociology of editorial. <laughs> politics. Uh, but uh, environment and archaeology, this sort of summed up your, your landscape or your ecological approach to issues, archaeological issues. Yes, And uh, I noticed just, I haven't read it at all, but I've, I've heard of it before. And <clears throat> what attracts me about it is that instead of just dealing in theory, scientific theory or methodology, you refer to specific regions. There's, there are regional examples which help the reader pull things together. Uh, so is there something more you'd like to talk about with, this, with respect to this book? Why did it get sec a second printing if it weren't popular? Uh, let's put it this way. Um, it filled a real need in archaeology at the time it appeared. There was great interest in these types of things. And uh, it was uh, 
exceptionally well reviewed in uh, science, a uh, three page review by leading archaeologists at Berkeley. And uh, this came in the uh, department at Wisconsin at a very opportune time because the word was just going around that I'd written this absolutely absurd book. <laughs> and um, the interest clearly came for many years out of uh, archaeology. This is where the sales were, and uh, um, archaeology students were uh, buying it, and it was being used in classrooms to uh, provide a framework of what was in effect geography, remedial geography perhaps in some ways, mm -hmm. for archaeologists, uh, because it provided a synopsis of the physical environment, biotic environment per se. It provided an introduction to um, more specific environments that concerned time ranges and areas in uh, the prehistoric record. Uh, it uh, dealt with uh, site studies um, that provided, in, in effect, the case study sort of information of how you can actually do it, what it tells you, what it doesn't tell you. And uh, it sold very well. And um, the um, um, need for a second edition came from exactly that market and uh, um, the book was, and uh, I was quite surprised about that, cited uh, as the uh, contribution that the uh, geographers gave me the uh, award for in 1968. I'm still not sure who was on that committee, but I was flattered that somebody had noticed it. And. Um, in the second edition, I tried then to, in effect, develop the cultural framework and also the matter of um, interrelationships between culture and environment much more explicitly than I had in the first. Yes. So the second uh, edition has uh, at least a good half on um, uh, an analysis of the prehistoric record as you would see it as, in effect, I think perhaps a cultural geographer. Uh, although the limitations of dealing with prehistory uh, from the point of view of culture, of course, are immense. So that's how that book developed, and uh, it, uh, um, it provided me, uh, shall we say, the uh, type of appointments that allowed me the luxury of developing further. Um, the problem ultimately is that uh, people who are between the fences uh, are often should we say, more often than not, penalized for what they do. Um, this particular book saved me the embarrassment that would have come uh, from uh, um, being somebody that did not conform to the uh, orthodoxy of either field that he was in. And um, uh, as a result, I was allowed to uh, uh, go further than this and to grow with time and uh, complete uh, you know, the sort of uh, larger development of uh, cultural interrelationships that I was really interested in because that is something that doesn't come overnight. Field of cultural ecology, you call it now, yes. But it's ironic almost, the timing of, the, of this award from the Association of American Geographers. I think it was at the same meeting that great revolutions were being spoken of and uh, the big issue was uh, positivism versus uh, anti-positivism and social revolution and here you come with a book about prehistoric man and ecolog arguments for an ecological approach to the field at a time when uh, only spatial analysis counted if I remember correctly. Oh yes. <laughs> so uh, did you ever worry about being a little bit uh, misfit in the trends of geography? Uh, not really uh, because uh, in 1966, I went to Chicago, and the uh, initiative for the appointment uh, came from the anthropology department. Uh -huh. And it was a joint appointment in anthropology and geography. In fact, for the first several years there, I didn't even have an office in the geography building. And um, I really wasn't particularly concerned as a result that uh, I was quite obviously out of sync with what was happening in the geography at the time. Uh, there is a great deal in this book, obviously, that is implicitly normative. Mm -hmm. But I uh, simply had no interest in uh, uh, developing uh, statements about uh, how these things should work that uh, would have uh, given the impression that it was intentionally positivistic. And uh, I didn't uh, expect that uh, the types of people that basically um, 
uh, dominating the field of geography at that time would be interested. And uh, um, it took quite some time, in fact, before I began to uh, integrate myself into the geography department in Chicago, which uh, I did in the Mikesell years, because uh, at that point they was a great deal more interested in what I was doing than uh, there had been when I came. When uh, um, I arrived at Chicago for my interview in uh, geography, the chairman at that time asked me, um, you know, a few polite questions, and he said, Carl, um, we're not really interested a bit in what you do, but the anthropologists want to have you, and we have no reason to object. <laughs> so I was willing to take that at face value. That's, that's fine. So you stayed at Chicago from 1966 until? 84. 84. So that, they were your main years of uh, full-time research in this particular area. Yeah. Yes. And then you came to Texas. Yes. D did Texas in some way symbolize a return to the south, to the sun? to um, proximity to Spanish-speaking, etc.? Yes, very much so. I uh, had um, visited Austin many times uh, over the years because one of the people that left Wisconsin in uh, those years when uh, a lot of people from Wisconsin were scattering to the winds. Um, and uh, I was really uh, very much impressed by the physical environment here. At the time, it, um, struck me more as being similar with East Africa mm -hmm. than with the Mediterranean world because I had in fact uh, been out in the um, areas a little further on the edge of town than where mm -hmm. I subsequently lived. And uh, I found it very romantic and uh, very often the light and then the sort of development of the weather in the course of the day, particularly in the summer months, is very similar to the way it is in East Africa. And uh, that appealed to me. Um, the interest that I was um, following more explicitly in um, uh, historical cultural geography in Spain um, then provided a new attraction because of the proximity to uh, the uh, Spanish colonial world that still has a very impressive cultural imprint in Texas. And it seemed that. Um, I would be almost next door to uh, um, something that was certainly very close to my heart. I hadn't quite conceived of uh, the border or Mexico as being a potential study area, which it has become. Um, but it certainly appealed to me, and uh, it seemed to be kind of a compromise that uh, I never really was going to be able to afford a uh, summer house in Spain, but uh, I might be able to live somewhere here in Austin that uh, would look a lot like it. and. Uh, we were quite lucky. You found one. That's yes. wonderful. That's really wonderful. Now, before we go further into your future plans, I'm sure you have many future plans for research along these lines, I do want to return to the question of how you integrate these diverse interests. I mean, you are a specialist in the archaeological, geological, climatological, and cultural ecological aspects of landscape. And recognized as such, you have medals from geological society, archaeological society, as well as you are now a member of the uh, fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. What's the secret? How can you integrate such a wide variety of fields? Are they separate worlds in you, or have you brought them together through some central curiosity that transcends all of them? Um, there is a central uh, curiosity that uh, does transcend all of them, uh, very much so, and I personally see no uh, um, real conflict between them, um, although I do at this point see work that is strictly geomorphological as being uh, increasingly tedious. But um, bringing them together actually is something that uh, did take a tremendous amount of time. Uh, I was interested in the things that I do now, uh, specifically in the last three or four years. Um, at the time I was in my undergraduate and graduate training, this is what really uh, was perhaps the strongest motivation for being in geography at all. However, at the time I just wasn't ready for it. Uh, I didn't have the training, I didn't have the experience. And uh, the uh, idea of trying to bridge 
uh, the social sciences and the natural sciences uh, was almost inconceivable in uh, the 1950s. A great deal has happened since that in terms of uh, introducing uh, systems theory, uh, the idea of modeling, uh, the uh, ways in which ecology can be used that transcend the narrow use of uh, ecology in the biological sciences. Um, these were things that were not part of one's repertoire of thought organization. And uh, it was very difficult for geographers in particular to cope with the um, duality of uh, cultural human interests on the one hand and their traditional interests in uh, the physical and biotic environment on the other. Very difficult thing to integrate. Mm -hmm. And um, so in a sense, I um, started off with the interest in the one area, then found myself drifting into the other for the reasons I've sort of outlined. And in the process, I became a physical geographer, uh, not because I had any great conviction uh, that I wanted to become one, but I became one because, in effect, I was uh, learning my professional craft. And uh, after having acquired the necessary experience there over 10 and 15 years, depending on how you want to define it, I then gradually began to work my way back into the much more explicit coping with cultural concerns uh, that um, uh, my increasing sophistication was allowing me to do. And so as I make that last uh, 10 years of transition uh, into what I'm now working on, um, I'm following, in fact, a fairly conscious strategy that has been with me for a long time, but which simply could not be implemented overnight. So I would say that uh, doing this type of thing uh, is something that cannot be done immediately. You have to acquire the um, uh, expertise and professionalism in um, the natural science part of the field, which is something that cannot be done easily. And this is one of the major problems that archaeologists have in trying to implement some of these uh, working methods in their field, because in a sense they hope that by taking a course or two, they've mastered the ecological approach to uh, um, archaeology, and of course it doesn't work that way. Even taking three, four, or five courses doesn't do it. It's something that really has to be worked at over a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. And um, similarly, to deal with culture is not something that you uh, can learn in a short time either. It's not a matter of uh, counting fence posts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something where you have to uh, come to grips with the complexity of how people are. And I was for a very long time in my life really absolutely mystified what made people tick. And uh, <clears throat> overcoming that as a barrier to dealing with them and then beginning to, in fact, enjoy the complexity of people and their reactions as both individuals and as communities, uh, working, in other words, as aggregates, they try something else than uh, what they are, in fact, doing as individuals, and learning, in a sense, the different levels of what a particular statement, an action or... Uh, an actual verbal statement means, uh, depending on when you hear it and how it's being said and reading between the lines, these are things that, you know, you don't pick up in a day. It takes, again, years and years. Mm -hmm. And so I feel comfortable <clears throat> now that I've learned enough over roughly mm -hmm. 25 years yes. to be able to do both things equally well and to, in a sense, see how the two come together. But it's something that you cannot train a student uh, at the level of the PhD to do. Doesn't work. Nor can you really encapsulate it in a formula such as it's all ecology no. or that it's all system. I've heard you speak on the methodological level, on the conceptual level, and on the, the substantive curiosity level as potential uh, ways that you integrate or that you, you can bring these things together. But I still don't know what the burning curiosity is that makes it worthwhile. You've talked about, uh, I love to know how it makes people tick. That covers a multitude. Uh, but you, you focus on history, on the past, rather than the present. I would think, given your empirical uh, penchant for observations and good data and so on, that you would, be, uh, you would find present-day landscapes more easy to handle in this integrated way. But no, instead you choose to remain with the archaeological or the historical. How now that's quite true. It, and it, um, it um, 
reflects something that is more than just uh, an accident of the way that I have worked or found opportunities for doing field research. It's uh, um, a deep-seated conviction that I have that uh, if you study a synchronic situation, in other words, a totally uh, contemporary world, um, whatever scale, you are faced with what is essentially the details of system maintenance. Mm -hmm. You're seeing relatively uh, short-term types of minor adjustments. Uh, you see very little that uh, gives you a sense of uh, how fundamental change works. And uh, to be able to understand the deeper-seated process, as I feel very, very strongly, you have to work historically. And these are the things I'm much more interested in. Uh, I'm obviously concerned with uh, modern world problems, uh, issues of uh, long-term uh, population growth, the uh, question of uh, development in the third world, the uh, issues of degradation of the environment, and so on, all these uh, issues pose. And um, I have taught a number of courses, from uh, one on applied uh, geomorphology to uh, variants of my cultural ecology course that deal with uh, contemporary issues. Um, I've gone through the process of really confronting these issues to the point that they became a rather traumatic emotional experience. And I conveyed that in class. Uh, but I, in fact, find that um, it is difficult to convey that same sense of outrage repeatedly year after year in the course, or even after two or three years. And um, to me, uh, the issues really are uh, understanding and uh, finding from different levels of understanding something about the uh, uh, range of potentials of what might in fact happen that are not necessarily part of a sort of a gloomy prediction uh, cause and effect type of issue. And uh, what I get out of my work is that uh, the decisions that people make are very often totally out of the realm of what you would have expected. Um, in our uh, case studies that we've done in eastern Spain, um, the entire region is part of a broader phenomenon in Spain at that time. In the second half of the 19th century, was faced with an expanding population at a time of uh, very finite resources. And uh, what did the people do to cope with that particular predicament? And uh, they tried so many different things. And as we've been able to, through interviews with the oldest people in our village, find out more about the actual decisions that were being made just about at the beginning of the present century. In other words, the time depth of uh, memory of the oldest individuals goes back to events that they can certainly at second hand still convey. And what we find is that at the level of decision making that uh, is still within the realm of oral tradition, um, one strategy after another was being tried to cope. Mm -hmm. uh, they began in the 1890s to uh, uh, grow uh, grapes on what had been the old goat pastures and sheep pastures because at that time the uh, French wine industry had been wiped out by the uh, phylloxera. And for about 20 years, they were able to make a tremendous amount of money by converting pasture into vineyards uh, until the same disease gradually moved down and hit the vineyards in Spain. At that point, they were wiped out. Uh, and then they, in a sense, held town council meetings where they discussed what the options were. And they had two different options. One was to uh, go back into uh, grazing activities, but this time on a larger scale, they were going to buy up the lands from the surrounding municipalities and run their herds all over the place. And the alternative possibility was to plant cork oak because they had heard about the uh, commercial value of cork and the area was ecologically suited for it. But uh, cork oak needed a 10 to 12 year startup period. They decided 
on the Corco because it had bitter potential. And they invested in that for 30 years. Uh, eventually, it uh, bombed because of a variety of uh, um, corporate uh, uh, bankruptcies of the companies they were dealing with. And then the Civil War came in. And uh, at that point, they had run out of their potential options. And at that point, only did they make that decision that uh, they'd always been trying to avoid, namely there was nothing better to do than to go to the big cities and work in industry. But to maintain the close ties with a village so that in a sense everybody that works in a city, whether it's in Valencia or in Barcelona, will try his best at least to come back for a summer vacation and if at all possible even for every weekend and they will still work in the fields for a few hours to maintain their ties with their roots. So in a sense they were going through a series of alternative possibilities, they were discussing them, they were arguing about them, they were always choosing the one that was closest to uh, their own cultural predilections. They saw things in a short versus a long-term strategy, they made decisions in favor of long-term remedial action. And behind this then is the unspoken problem of uh, actual birth control, and they had been in fact coping with that for some time already because we can see in the statistics that the population depending on the village, is leveling off anywhere between 1850 and 1910. And then suddenly starts to go down. And this is before, in fact, the records show that people have begun to emigrate to the cities. So despite the fact that they are devout Catholics, that they are conservative, traditional, uh, small rural villages in the so-called backwaters, here we find people quietly making decisions in terms of the number of children that they can possibly have under the circumstances, making rational decisions as to how the villages will cope with shortage of resources, how they maintain a very open view towards information from the cities of what the options really are, uh, working with those options in mind and finally finding a kind of a, a compromise solution whereby they live in the city but still have not given up the roots and where those family members that stay in the village, in fact, are able to, in fact, are almost commissioned to hold on to the land at all costs. Land is not to be sold. It has to be kept, even if it's not worked. And if they can't pay for the taxes, the man in the city will pay for the taxes for some relatives so that the name of the family remains attached to those particular plots of land that they've had since whoever knows when. So those are things that you begin to appreciate are part and parcel of understanding what will happen in terms of the 30-year future, the 50-year future. You can't just look at the UN statistics and say that the birth rate has been going so and so, the um, uh, carryover in terms of demography tells us we're going to have a such and such high uh, population level. This will mean so and so for the uh, uh, pressure on resources. It will mean that for uh, environmental degradation and we will have this and this kind of a disaster. Um, when the population peaked in our little Sierra communities in the period around 1880, nobody could ever have predicted what happened. They coped reasonably well. They have maintained an integrity of community even while living outside. They have found a solution that is still within the framework of what is culturally acceptable. And they have done so in a way that has been reasonably conscious and deliberate. And they have tested options and alternatives. And they have found a way between them in sequence. And this is something that I think that uh, has a great deal of bearing on, uh, um, in a sense, uh, evaluating a problem in a third world country. Uh, one can't simply assume that these are big trends that you can look at as statistical aggregates and that will lead inevitably to a certain set of outcomes because in a sense those people are just as rational as discursive and interactive in their community settings as our people were too. So you obviously are very convinced of a, a sort of idealist interpretation of history that is conscious human subjects coping, making decisions, choosing and so on. Do you reject the kind of structuralist way of telling the story? that uh, it's economics and material realities that really go d dictate the course of history. I'm afraid we've run out of time. This is enough for another tape, I'd say. OK, sorry. Five minutes. Oh. Um, five minutes, we finished. What is your most important future plan, research-wise? 
Well, to, um, you know, come back to the uh, in the initial uh, question there, um, I believe those are big frameworks. Those are the uh, essentially mega frameworks that allow you to interpret larger trends uh, for larger regions and aggregates of uh, communities or uh, cities, whatever it might be, in terms of providing a broader framework for discussion, interpretation, idea, uh, formulation of problems and so on. Uh, in that sense, they're very useful. But I think that at the point where you begin to deal with the realities, you have to come to grips with something much more uh, manageable and uh, you have to deal with something that is closer to the ground. And whether this is done in terms of a, an archival investigation or an archival plus archaeological type investigation as we've tried toward the medieval period, or whether you try it from some of those sort of mixed uh, uh, interview and um, um, historical kinds of approaches we've used for the last 150 years, um, you do have to come to grips with um, the mechanics of how things have worked at the micro scale and uh, what have been the basic motivations, uh, what have been the value systems that have been most sacrosanct in terms of uh, when decision, hard decisions have had to be made. Um, at that level, you simply go out of the realm of certain kinds of uh, useful theoretical frameworks. And uh, it is a different type of experience that has to be seen for its own sake and in a sense on the basis of several good case studies uh, it is possible to uh, um, develop a rather different interpretation of, shall we say, a macroeconomic interpretation of uh, uh, the quotes 19th century in Spain or something of the sort. So the two have merit, it's just that in a sense they do illuminate different types of uh, um, things and they've shed light on complementary um, issues that you may want to confront. And what is your most exciting new fr research frontier in a couple of minutes? <laughs> well, basically, uh, uh, I am concerned now uh, to take the experience that we've gained in Spain to uh, dealing with relationships between Mexico in terms of its colonial past and Spain and seeing Mexico as a place where many things have been found or are present or waiting to be discovered in the landscape that derive from Iberian roots. And in seeing these, recognizing them, and trying to understand them, I am now asking very different questions in Spain at a macro level as opposed to at a micro level often. And I find that this going back and forth now between Spain and Mexico is becoming a very fascinating arena of trying to uh, uh, implement a kind of uh, cultural ecology that uh, is, I suppose, comparative. That's a wonderful horizon toward which to face. Uh, you've given us a tremendous insight into a very complex and interesting uh, life experience. And what is most challenging, I think, is the way you persist in learning something new from each of these experiences. Thank you very much, Carl, for coming today.